Web security is outdated. Did you know that your health data can be sold for up to 50 times more than your credit card details? Can you imagine trying to get health insurance and getting rejected because of your stolen health data? And it's not just your data. Protecting people from biotechnology threats in today's globalized, hyper-connected, and health-centric world is increasingly challenging. We're going from this to this, and we're not really questioning who we trust with these future products and what security we expect of them. Now, you may be wearing smartwatches that track your activity or smart rings that track your sleep. I'm wearing both of these right now. And in the future, you'll be ingesting smart pills that track your gut health. In fact, it was when I was building one that I realized firsthand that no one is really thinking about the criminal impact of the products that we design. There I was in the lab designing biological sensors to, you know, track health markers in the gut. But my mind was racing at how delicate that data really was. More identifiable than DNA itself. Revealing information about your lifestyle, your diet, who you live with, if you live in the city or have a pet, and in some instances, social behavior. So on one hand, building the pill promised personalized medicine. But on the other, scary new crime forms like neurohacking. Hi, I'm Dr. Miriam, and yes, this is what I do. Uh, through my company, Bronic, and just like Minority Report, I focus on identifying emerging crime threats facilitated by biotechnology before their widespread use. And predicting crime is hard, as I learned uh, as a specialist officer for the London Metropolitan Police. You'd think that police know about these crimes, how to identify them, detect them, even prevent them. Uh, but unfortunately, we used to call ourselves slaves to the radio because we would react to incidents as they'd come trying to stop thief rather than think thief, as that would better help us anticipate and prepare for the crimes. But how can you anticipate a crime that hasn't even happened? Well, we use crime science. Crime science embarks on the perspective of crime as an event and attempts to understand it through its immediate environment and less on how the offender developed. So it's a bit like looking at this plant and not looking at this plant, but rather its conditional environment, the available water, sunlight, nutrients in the soil that helped it to grow. Now, to translate this to biotechnology crime, biotechnology products are influenced by product design and hence by designers. They can be designed to be portable, like this pocket-sized genome analyzer that can determine DNA sequences in clinical samples, but that can also fit in my pocket as I run away with it without anyone noticing. Biotechnology products can be designed to be movable, like this machine right here, which analyzed all of our COVID samples, but that can also be hacked to allow hackers to access and alter sensitive patient health data. Biotechnology products can be designed to be movable or mobile, like this on-the-go laboratory that has absolutely no signage to keep trespassers out. Products can be installed in place like this ventilation hood that keeps research from getting contaminated that solely relies on electricity to keep the air sterile. And now to products that we know and use every day, 
they can be designed to be wearable, conveniently to be worn on the wrist as we exercise to collect health data, our activity data, but that also reveals where we live and where military bases are. Finally, products can be designed to be part of other products, like software that make devices functional or dysfunctional if they're hacked into and all of the data sold. And we've covered the future of ingestibles too. Now, these risk factors can be considered early in the design process of the products that we build, taking into consideration these potential crimes by thinking thief. But so far, all these risk factors in biotechnology have taken a very much top-down approach or governance regulation based on past cases. But surely the individuals that use the technology on the ground are better equipped to capture future misuses. And so we took a very different approach. I spent two years studying biohackers as part of my PhD at UCL, just to investigate this very thing. And while you might be picturing someone like this, biohackers are individuals who practice science. Now, okay, sometimes their science is a little bit unusual, like genetically engineered glow-in-the-dark pets or magnetic implants. They do practice science in unconventional places, like here in a garage and here in a kitchen. <laughs> what a learning curve that was, to be honest. They're what we call a hidden population or a community of unknown size that's difficult to reach and that has strong privacy concerns with its practices. But I call them our non-traditional experts because biohackers expand the boundaries of biology, technology, through innovation, testing the resilience of our legal, moral, and social frameworks. In fact, we found that non-traditional experts like biohackers were able to identify twice as many crime threats than your conventional security professionals in industry, academia, and even in government. And in fact, a lot of the predicted crimes were actually observed during COVID-19, and we informed our stakeholders, including the United Nations. Yet, in today's biotechnology legislation, there is no requirement for crime to be assessed, and security discussions are often limited to siloed expertise. You see, the way that we practice science is changing. And so do we need to change the security for the biotechnology that we build in today's interconnected world? Now, to properly design a product against crime, we have to incorporate diverse expertise early in the design process. For this, designers need to adapt a crime science approach that allows them to expand their four-function thinking to thinking thief. Not only designing products that are user-friendly, but also ab-user unfriendly. So a little bit like hiring a biohacker, not only to design a hacker-proof product that would stop a thief, but that would prevent them to seal it in the first place. And we already see these concepts apply to other industries. In the built environment, it is a requirement. During my time as a security uh, consultant, that was our job, to assess buildings and their environments, conduct crime risk assessments, and design security solutions for those buildings according to neighborhood crime. Biotechnology, too, should be designed against crime. And you have a huge part to play in this. There is no technology without your bio. As consumers, you should demand for secure products. 
in the same way that you look at the eco-friendliness of the products and their environmental impact, so too you should start thinking about the security and crime implications of the biotechnology that you find on the market, especially when it involves your health. There is urgency to bringing crime science to biotechnology, one product at a time. To close, raise your hand if you grabbed some candy or were given some uh, sweets in the break. Okay, great, everyone almost. You might not have questioned this, but the candy has been covered with invisible ink to represent a biological threat that my colleagues are going around with UV lights to demonstrate. We can agree then. Biosecurity is outdated. We need to catch up with the emerging crime threats, especially the ones that we can't see. Thank you.